Well, welcome back everyone. And in a flash, here we are at the closing session of the 2021 Canary Summit. I'm honored to introduce Dr. Stephanie Carbon, an associate professor at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. Stephanie's research interests are in international and national security and technology. She's currently teaching in the areas of critical infrastructure protection, technology and warfare, and intelligence and national security. Stephanie holds a PhD from the London School of Economics and among other publications, she's the author of Stand On Guard, Reassessing Threats to Canada's National Security and co-author of the forthcoming Intelligence and Policymaking, The Canadian Experience. From 2012 to 2015, she was an intelligence analyst with the Government of Canada focusing on national security issues. I'm really looking forward to Stephanie's talk. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie Carbon. Joining us from Ottawa. Hi, everyone. It really is a pleasure to join you here today. I mean, it is uh, the issues that you're speaking about at this conference are fundamentally important to the future of university research and research generally. And I do hope that I can offer a unique perspective uh, for you today. Uh, there we go. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the cybersecurity environment, response and, chan uh, and challenges, uh, something that I think we're familiar with. So we'll go pretty quick through that. Uh, but then I want to spend a, lo a little bit more time on the relationship between national security and the academy. I want to look at the historical context, which does set up some of the challenges that we're currently facing, but also then the current threat environment. Finally, I'd like to then look at what research institutions should be asking for, the kinds of questions, the kinds of requests that they should be making from government. Now, my presentation is to a large extent Canadian focused, but I do think that the issues that Canada is dealing with are, are certainly not Canadian alone. And hopefully, if you are joining us from an international audience uh, or from another country, I certainly hope that there are some lessons for you here as well. So before we begin, I just think I should give you a little bit of background uh, as well. Uh, you heard the introduction, but between 2012 and 2015, I did work as an intelligence analyst with the intelligence assessment branch of the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. Before this, I was an academic in the UK and a professor. I'm now a professor at Carleton University. So I'm kind of speaking from an odd position, right? I'm probably one of the few people in Canada who uh, has had experience working in an intelligence service, but also has a long, lot of experience working as an academic. And I like to think that I'm hopefully literate in both languages. Um, but I also appreciate the, uh, trying to come to this question about research security and, and secure research partnerships from the perspective of social sciences rather than the natural sciences. Although my work often does find me working with engineers um, and a lot of people on our critical infrastructure program at Carleton University, which is a lot of fun. So I like to think I have a little bit of that uh, natural science and, and applied science perspective as well. Um, but of course, I also speak from the perspective of a white female professor. A lot of the issues we're going to spe be speaking about today does specif specifically seem to affect the Asian Canadian community. And I do want to keep that perspective in mind. Hate crimes against the Asian Canadian communities are in some areas of the country up 700%. And I think when we're addressing some of the challenges today, we also have to make sure that we're doing it through an anti-racist perspective. And so I want to put that out at the forefront of this, that when we're talking about national security, we have got this wrong in the past. That's a big part of this presentation. And so when we're addressing these challenges looking forward, can we actually do so in a way that kind of can bring everyone a little bit more together rather than uh, creating a climate of fear? So what is the Canadian context in which research is kind of finding itself under new threats and challenges? Well, let's look at the context generally. And again, I don't think we have to spend too much time on this. Um, we have attacks, right? We have, we, we've seen an increase in the level of, of uh, DDoS attacks, the uh, distributive denial of service attacks, which, you know, sometimes are just a bunch of, uh, for better or worse terms, a, a script kitties kind of, kind of coming together and trying to jam up a website. 
But we have seen the kind of attacks, the, the dying attacks that were uh, in the United States uh, that can really take out um, when they're put against domain name registry services. The internet in a, a large swath of the United States uh, and, and you know that could affect Canada as well. And so I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind is that um, you know when you do have these kind of large scale DDoS attacks that they can affect our research institutions trying to do their job if they are uh, being uh, directed at them. Um, and again, we also are seeing some more severe attacks in terms of this, uh, the, the software that's designed to attack supervisory controlled and data acquisition systems. Uh, everyone, of course, always thinks of Stuxnet, but there's been a variety of different uh, Stuxnets that have come out since then. And it's not clear to the extent that, you know, universities uh, are the, or research institutions are the direct target of these styles of attacks, but I think it's important to remember that they can be affected by them. Secondly, of course, is espionage. Now, this is clearly a more significant threat. And we are increasingly seeing Canadian officials named China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea as uh, kind of espionage threats or, or engaging in this kind of behavior. But there's almost certainly more countries that are involved here as well. And of course, we've seen everything kind of being uh, uh, targeted um, from trying to, you know, figure out uh, just you know, I, like there's this great expression that CISA sometimes uses. They say that, uh, you know, spies have gone from wearing trench coats to lab coats. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind that actually this is, you know, whereas attacks, sometimes I think the universities are probably on the edge of these things, kind of collateral damage. The espionage, this is where, uh, you know, universities really are, I think, kind of at the forefront of national security activity. We'll get a bit more into that in just a minute. Um, crime, um, this is another significant threat. Numerous universities in Canada have now been targeted by ransomware. Uh, I'm sure if you're following the news, you've heard about, um, you know, the hospital situation out in Newfoundland, where hospitals are basically resorting to using pen and paper to try and uh, mitigate uh, the effects of all of their IT systems effectively having been shut down by ransomware attacks. And so, you know, this is, I think, something that we're going to see increase in the future, the number of ransomware attacks against universities. And finally, we have the issue of foreign interference or what's sometimes called clandestine foreign inter. Uh, sorry, clandestine Ford influence. And these are influence and intimidation campaigns. And we really are trying to deal at least from a Canadian perspective, uh, how to deal with the issue of misinformation online, that, um, disinformation online, and something they off that's sometimes now called malinformation, where you know basically files are stolen from uh, a, a, an institution or an individual and then put online either as is or altered in a way to make that person look bad. So that's malinformation. Um, and universities uh, are often a, a flashpoint in the cultural tensions that, um, you know, kind of online trolls are seeking to stoke. So I think that, you know, this is an area that can be affecting um, the cyber security landscape for universities and research institutions as well. So this is kind of that larger context, and I've tried to highlight where universities are, are kind of um, putting themselves. So I think that, um, you know, this is really where we're seeing kind of the, 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 the landscape, right, um, when we're talking about espionage targets. The support for state-owned enterprises um, is one of the things that we do worry about with regards to espionage targets. We worry about vaccine research. Um, this is something that uh, CIS has actually publicly commented on in July of 2020, that actually, they and they believe they publicly named Russia as one of the countries that was trying to actively steal intellectual property being developed by uh, Canadian research institutions. Um, but that's not it. Again, you know, if we go back to the uh, trench coats versus lab coats, the idea of strategies, bottom lines, interests, um, these just knowing what a, an institution is thinking or what it's trying to do is very much of interest to a number of countries. Uh, this is a very old example, Coca-Cola, when they were doing their um, uh, they were considering buying a Chinese company. China was not a huge fan of this idea and kind of looked, you know, they, China was, Coca-Cola was allegedly hacked by Chinese uh, backed um, hackers who tried to figure out what their bottom lines were and used that to kind of counter any attempt of Coca-Cola to try and buy this particular company. Uh, more recently, we have seen attacks against managed service, uh, managed service providers who are, um, you know, again, with the cloud, they're providing a lot of, and, and certainly 
certainly since the pandemic, providing even more online services for a number of companies that are out there. And of course, they have incredible amounts of sensitive data, everything from HR records to um, what files that they're actually working on to what their corporate plans are to their finances to their bottom lines, all these different kinds of things. One thing that we don't think about a lot is personal information. So the health and financial records of um, companies that are out, uh, uh, of people who are, are out there, um, because, you know, this actually can provide uh, malicious actors information about the patterns of life, maybe understand the weaknesses of certain people or certain organizations, and it can provide them a leg up if they want to do further exploitative operations down the line. Uh, one of the things we did see is a tremendous hack in the Office of Personnel Management in 2015, which is one of the largest data hacks out there. And it basically stole all the information and records of government employees, which effectively, you know, when fed into certain machine learning or algorithms can be put together in ways that help define patterns of life, or they can perhaps find, you know, who's talking to which government employee. And again, there's a potential there to either target people for, for perhaps further kind of malicious activity, or in another way to perhaps figure out, you know, are your own citizens engaging with uh, people from another government that you're not particularly happy about, and then you can target them. And then you have the kind of all the above, right? The solar wind hacks, the Microsoft Exchange server attacks that we've seen, right? Where just reams of information are being stolen. And I think this is the point I really wanna drive home and I'm sure it's been driven home already is that the activities that we're seeing are really not just targeting data, not just targeting personnel files, but all kinds of data that can be fed into machine learning algorithms, right? Um, you know, data is, is in some ways the new gold. And it can really help, um, you know, adversarial states put together not just like challenges, uh, say, to the West or, or these kinds of things, but really try to, you know, uh, you know, feed their own algorithms and, and come up with certain machine learning results in, in, you know, in ways that perhaps we ourselves would be uncomfortable with. A lot of these adversarial countries, of course, don't have privacy laws. They, they don't have to worry about how this data is treated. And it's something that I think we do have to be cognizant of. As researchers, uh, we collect huge amounts of data and we put them towards ends, like whether it's healthcare, or whether it's just trying to understand societal trends, are we appreciating the ways in which this data can be put together and merged with other kinds of data in order to paint pictures uh, of, of certain either individuals, societies, vulnerable populations that can be uh, exploited for ends that, frankly, we'd be uncomfortable with? So what are the challenges here? Um, well, I know you're aware of the wide variety of cyber challenges out there, but I think the three main points that I'd want to drive home are this, is that I think really uh, we as a society and we're, un we're unprepared to, to really face this kind of growing threat and the growing sophistication of, of this threat, right? Um, the kind of uh, sophistication of the attacks we've seen, whether it's solar winds or the Microsoft attack, exchange server attacks. I mean, these are, these are very large. Um, we, if anything, we're still, you know, especially since the pandemic, we're putting more and more information online about ourselves and we're not designing systems for safety. And this is something that I think really impacts university. I'll talk a little bit about this later on, but, you know, we're often looking for the fastest, cheapest, quickest solution, particularly when we're in a pandemic situation and suddenly we have to move all of our stuff online. Uh, we're not choosing the devices or software that was designed with security in mind. We're picking what's cheap, what's accessible, and what's easy. Secondly, we have outdated policies. And by this, I mean don't just mean universities. I mean the government writ large, right? It's hard to keep up. Um, we don't necessarily have safety standards in there, although there's been a lot of talk about moving in this kind of particular direction. Um, and then finally, there's a lack of trust between governments, the private sector, and academia. And this is actually another theme I'm going to return to in just a minute, that kind of real lack of uh, trust, I think, between government and academia, but also the private sector, right? They're not happy. You know, if they're happy, they're not happy going to the government and sticking their hands up and being like, oh, I've been hacked. You know, uh, this is something that they have to worry about, too, for their own reputation uh, in terms of representing, you know, speaking of the stockholder, uh, you know, the stockholders and their companies, uh, just encouraging people to do business with them. Right. Uh, this is something that they worry about, too. So how do we generate trust that, you know, companies feel they can come forward to government 
without fearing that, you know, their reputations are going to be ruined forever. So universities specifically, um, what is the challenge here? Well, I talked a little bit about this idea of trust and, you know, we do need to speak with each other in order to have trust, uh, you know, in order to solve these problems, right? National security has kind of been sitting on for more or less the last 40 years in some ways, uh, intelligence mountain, right? They, they know about these threats, but they don't really talk about them. And academia, on the other hand, they've have a fairly suspicious view of national security and not necessarily for the wrong reasons, right? Um, there's an unfortunate history here, and I think it's an important context to bring forward. The RCMP was using, you know, in the, during the Cold War, a series of counter subversion tactics on university campuses, something that's been well documented by a series of academics, happy to talk a bit more about this in the Q&A, which resulted in professors being spied upon, campus groups being monitored, and substantial pieces of university sector being viewed through a national security lens in cases when it was probably not appropriate at all. And more recently, there's been a lot of criticism that CSIS and law enforcement have been engaging in uh, monitoring Muslim groups on campuses, um, something we've never really had a huge amount of transparency on, and which further is still remains a lot of hard feelings and suspicions within the Muslim community. And, you know, it was interesting. I had uh, a talk actually this morning with someone uh, for, who who's done a lot of work with the Muslim community about this very question and said, you know, I'm worried about what's happened to us in the last 20 years will now happen to the Chinese community as well. And so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, this is the context in which the conversation about research security and research partners are having today. Um, national security has often got it wrong when it comes to university, and frankly, they can get it wrong again. And universities need to keep this in mind as much as the government, um, right? And and the result of this history, though, is not just the fact that, you know, that you know, universities are, are hesitant to talk to national security, but also now, you know, because of a lot of the backlash of these policies, national security institutions are also not sure how they should be engaging with universities. They're kind of out of practice. National security agencies tend to treat universities and research institutions as what's called sensitive sectors, right? So if you want to talk to a sensitive sector, you actually have to get layers and layers and layers of permission in order to do so, right? We have constructed a very big wall between national security and academia, and, and for good reason. And the reason is the history I've just spoken about. Um, this wall is important right? This wall needs to remain in a free and democratic society. You don't want government and national security telling researchers what they should think or what they should be researching or what to do. But increasingly with the threat environment, we also are starting to realize we need windows in these walls through which conversations can be taking place in an open and transparent manner. And it's my hope that events like this and really a lot of the nascent conversations that I think we're having around these issues um, will create a system where we can you know, protect our research, protect our economic national security, but also do so within an ethical framework. So the reason is that we do need to have these conversations, right? The, the things that we need to talk about between the walls and the windows is um, that there are a number of security issues. And I've kind of anchored this presentation around cybersecurity because it's the theme of the conference. But let's also be real here. We also have a number of other issues that are happening um, in the national security world that are affecting university campuses. The first of this is surveillance of student groups on campus, right? We've seen a number of front groups. Uh, there's been allegations made against the Chinese Students and Scholars Associations, um, which have allegedly been engaging in, in activities that can, where, where you know, Chinese students are monitored for what they say on campus and, and who they join. Uh, between 2015 and 2018, Human Rights Watch interviewed over 100 academics and scholars in Australia, Canada, France, the United Kingdom, and the United States regarding their experiences regarding uh, being monitored. And it found multiple cases where the families of students were threatened based upon the views expressed uh, by students in Western classrooms. And others said that they remained silent out of fear that their remarks would be reported to the Chinese authorities. 
There's also the effects of uh, clandestine foreign interference campaigns on university campuses. So, for example, we have seen in Canada the targeting of Uyghur and Tibetan events and students. Uh, in McMaster University, there was the shutting down of a Uyghur activist at the University of Toronto Scarborough when a Tibetan woman became the university president. She was targeted by a harassment campaign. Um, in 2013, the University of Calgary was punished when it had the Dalai Lama come to speak, and suddenly University of Calgary degrees were no longer recognized by Beijing. So we've seen this as well. It's not just Chinese uh, students. We have also seen uh, clandestine foreign interference campaigns against Tamil uh, Tamil students within the Tamil community, uh, Saudi uh, students, as well as Russian students as well. So it's not just a Chinese thing. Uh, there's a number of other actors in this space as well. But it shows that you know there is a wider context here in which these conversations need to be taking place. There's questions about how area studies are done. Um, you know, we, a lot of times we farm these things out to uh, state controlled institutions such as Confucius Institutes, right? Um, and we give them the private information of students in order to uh, for them to take courses. Uh, there's been reports that Confucius Institutes censor the kinds of ideas and conversations that can take place and have also fired in, uh, individual uh, professors when they have beliefs that perhaps don't accord with um, the Confucius Institute uh, uh, beliefs. Speaking more to the cyber side then, um, we can also talk about intellectual property theft, which we've talked about. This can happen though through uh, either hacking attempts or by insider threats. This is a challenge of course, because universities, as I'm sure you're aware, are built to share information. But how that information is then used and feeds into the Canadian economy is important. When we're looking at projects that uh, you know, have large amounts of data, as we've already uh, spoken. Um, and here in particular, I'm talking about projects that collect large amounts of data on individuals, particularly Canadians, but others as well. Um, how that data is collected, stored, and shared with partners is really important. And while we open access is fundamentally important, um, you know, in my meetings with scientists, it was really interesting talking about these issues. They actually want more open access. This is something that they're they're very very uh, keen to stress to the government. But when you have projects that can piece together these different pieces of information to paint that pattern of life, we have to think about, you know, is this something that we need to be a little bit more careful when we're just kind of sharing the data upon which our research is based. And then finally, we I think we need to be concerned about the ends to which research is being put. Canada is a leader in developing artificial intelligence, including facial recognition, machine learning, and applications with potentially surveillance capabilities. And frankly, authoritarian states want this technology, right? And in a lot of cases, there's concern that this could be used um, to engage in human rights abuses. We do need some kind of arms control um, and export um, agreements here. And universities do need to think about what are the potential ends to which research done on our campuses can be put. Uh, is it really a matter of open access when we're talking about collaborating with a military owned institution that's developing facial recognition that could be used in surveillance of a domestic population? There's going to be other uh, unanticipated issues as well. And I've talked about this, the fact, you know, going back to the, the three kind of broad challenges, the context in which, you know, we don't design for security and we look for easy solutions. Last year, when universities realized that teaching would have to be online due to the COVID-19 pandemic, universities turned to using Alibaba software, right? That is the software of a Chinese tech giant, increasingly under Beijing's control in order to help students kind of navigate the firewall that kind of blocks China off from the rest of the world. But such a setup may have been convenient and, and been easy for Chinese students, but it also could easily enable surveillance of those same students in classrooms, um, and not just the Chinese students, but all those students in the classrooms. And in addition, there was some concern that there'd be credential theft, right? So if a student is using credentials to get into a classroom, um, you, know, uh, you know, authorities from the countries where these firewalls are being used could in fact get those same credentials and then use it to try and log into the other accounts that students might have. The decision to use Alibaba software was in no doubt made in a hurry. And again, I, I don't, I'm not jealous of the administrators who had to make these decisions in, in, in quick and real time. 
However, it does not seem that universities really thought through the implications of their decision here and whether or not they were putting the safety of their own students first. And, you know, did they actually ever think about, you know, talking to national security about these uh, arrangements? And it's clear that they actually didn't. Uh, no one really kind of thought about the security risks. And but even if they had, would they have known who to contact, uh, why they should contact them and how they should do so? And this is why I think windows in the walls between academia and national security are needed. A conversation with national security agencies needs to take place. But this has to be done responsibly, and it has to avoid the mistakes that we've made in the past when government has found itself reacting to an entirely new, evolving security threat. I mean, I think you guys all appreciate this, and so I'm not going to belabor the point too much. But it really does help think about, um, you know, how we can have these these research partnerships. And so what I've been trying to come up with is a list of, of things that I think universities should be asking for and research institutions as we're seeing the government slowly put restrictions on research activities, right? It's, we're in a very nascent stage at this point, but this may be an area where the government could be expanding in the future. Um, and, you know, already we have seen the the guide to re, uh, responsible research partnerships or secure research partnerships put about, out by the uh, Ministry of Innovation, Science and Economic Development. So I've tried to come up with these five things that I think we should be keeping in mind and that research institutions and universities should be explicitly asking for. The first is that um, government policy is entirely incoherent in this area. Um, it really, you know, there is no coherent approach to how the government is looking at the questions and issues here. And, you know, on the one hand, we have certain government departments that are actively trying to uh, increase the amount of Chinese business here in Canada and Canadian business in China, right? Global Affairs Canada, it's part of their mandate. On the other hand, you have, I said, you know, the innovation science and economic development, putting in these new restrictions uh, in place. Are these two entities even talking to each other in, in doing this? And I don't, again, I don't envy universities who are trying to navigate all of this. Um, it, it really is, is a complex situation. And it doesn't even, you know, does any of this even include provincial authorities, which actually have the mandate for education in Canada as well? And you know what? They don't, frankly. Um, and so this is a problem. We need to actually develop a coherent policy that brings together different layers of government. So there's many different pieces of the pie, um, but I think that, you know, this is, this is, or universities need to be coming together to ask universities to develop a coherent policy around these responsible research relationships. The second here issue is transparency. Um, these conversations between research institutions, universities, and government really do need to be as transparent as possible. Um, there was a time where, you know, I worked at CSIS and we wouldn't even say the word China publicly, right? Uh, you, you weren't allowed to do that because it was just seen as too sensitive. Um, and this, I assure you, actually made it really hard to talk about national security threats, particularly cyber threats at the time. Um, so what, what I mean by transparency here is honesty. Uh, if we are not honest about the threat and we just talk about vague generalities, it's a recipe for paranoia, right? We're not going to, people are going to be overly cautious and it's going to severely impact researchers. And again, I think researchers of, of Asian Canadian descent. So that's the one thing we have. The governments need to be absolutely fundamentally clear about what they're talking about when they're saying they're worried about research partnerships. But transparency is also clarity about process and decision making. When applications for research funding is made, it should not be in a black box where an answer mysteriously comes out, right? It should be clear feedback, uh, suggestions for improvement where there are concerns, and answers and guidance should be offered with any decision that is made regarding research applications under these new framework and rules that are coming into place. There's oversight and review. Um, we need to make sure our national security agencies uh, that are responsible for review and oversight, so in particular the National Security Intelligence Review Agency and the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, they actually can do oversight here. And I think this is just so fundamentally important, particularly getting back to that other issue of transparency, right? People, you know, we can't have this as some kind of black box and we need to make sure that the results of any kind of attempt to secure research relationships aren't unfairly biasing a particular community in Canada, right? And they can also offer advice on how to improve and ameliorate any kinds of negative situation that um, 
uh, is out there. I also think research institutions and universities should be arguing for an automatic and independent review of the research security guidelines um, every three to five years after the fact that they've now been put in place, right? We should make sure that these kinds of things are not again, damaging Canada in any way and are achieving the desired results without um, creating too much bias against one particular community. The fourth issue here is resources. Now, universities, I'm sure they always love to ask for resources, so I don't think this will be too hard of a sell. But in terms of resources, I don't just mean universities in order to deal with these new rules and perhaps to make up some of the funding that would otherwise be lost. I also mean that the people doing the review work in government, whether it's a review agency or whether it's CSIS, who will be reviewing a lot of these applications, is there enough people with enough expertise to make sure that the research review process is not gummed up and like, there's not a log jam, right? We need to make sure that the, this review process of responsible research partnerships is actually well-funded and moves very quickly because otherwise it's unfair and no one wants to be waiting six months for a decision from a national security agency that they may have very little insight in. It's just, it's just unfair. And finally, the ethics and human rights framework here is really important. Um, again, I, I stress this because I think it's a shocking statistic that in places like Vancouver, um, hate crimes have gone up 700% against Asian uh, Canadians. Um, so let's be clear, the, the need to respond to cha national security challenges on campus is not specifically China focused, but it is, you know, again, there's, there's Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Israel, you know, Israel, if you include the, um, for example, uh, the NSO group and their kind of surveillance software. Um, but I think it's fair to say this will disproportionately impact Chinese scholars. And so Anything done in this space not, needs to not only be transparent, reviewed, and well-funded, but also done with an ethics and human rights framework at the core of it. And I'll give an example as to why this is so important in the final minutes of my presentation. Uh, basically, in the mid-2000s, it became known to Canadian authorities that there was going to be a no-fly list that impacted Canadians unless Canada created its own list. So they did. Canada created its own no-fly list in the mid-2000s under the Paul Martin government and then later expanded under the Harper government. And unfortunately, um, a number of, you know, they, they created a list, but they did never created a redress system because this, this program was created in a panic, right? Um, and, you know, they could put people on the list, but for some reason they couldn't actually take people off the list if they actually shared the same name as someone, but were entirely innocent. And what we found was that there were a number of children, you know, four years old, two years old, who shared the same name as someone who had been put on the list but there was no way to confirm that this person actually wasn't that person, even if they were two years old. And this really did put a lot of families in a negative position. If you're flying from, you know, if you're abroad and suddenly your son's or daughter's name comes up on a no fly list, um, not every country takes the, uh, a very liberal approach to that issue, right? It put actually people in danger. It didn't just inconvenience them. It actually made their lives genuinely worse. This oversight has taken decades to fix and by some measures actually still hasn't been fixed. And again, they look suspicious that they travel abroad. Um, it made them feel like second class citizens. And again, the Muslim community felt disproportionately affected. So as we move to kind of restrict or put, you know, try to have these conversations between national security and academia, and as we create policies, we really do need to be making sure that this doesn't turn into another no-fly list kids. We need to make sure that researchers of color feel safe and that they're part of the Canadian university system. And I'll be lying to you, I don't think there's an easy answer here, but I think we have to start off by acknowledging the real risks that are happening, right? We have to adopt an ever green approach. I don't like the word evergreen, but I struggle to find another word. But by evergreen, I mean, we have to acknowledge that we may not be getting these policies in place right the first time, that we need to really kind of keep these conversations going and ensure that the policy levers needed to manage and balance any kind of attempts to really restrict research or to kind of ensure that research is being put to ends to which Canadian taxpayers would support are, are kept in good working order. And having a clear policy, transparency, reviews, human resources framework, I think will help all of this. And I think as we're dealing with the very real challenges to universities and university campuses, um, we, can, we can hopefully come up with some kind of balance um, 
where researchers, national security, the government, and Canadians can be happy with the result. And I'll end my comments there and would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Stephanie, thanks so much. That was a great presentation full of really uh, thought provoking ideas and issues to explore. We have a few questions from the audience. First one relates to your comments around transparency. Uh, is there a danger that your window turns into a one way mirror? I love that question. And the answer is yes. Uh, I don't think we can deny that risk, right? Um, where you know, university, you know, security is looking in and universities only see a mirror. And again, I, I've been trying to refer to that as the black box. So how do we counter that? So one of the things I talked a little bit about in the presentation was this idea of the National Security Intelligence Review Agency and outside agencies that are responsible for uh, reviewing these activities can come in and I don't want to say smash the mirror, but making maybe make sure it is that two way mirror and provide some over like some insight into how these processes are working and how they're actually affecting um, Canadian universities as well. But I also think that universities need to be vocal. If national security is being vague about the kinds of threats that, that are out there, saying, like, mm, well, we just don't really like research this way. Well, that's not specific. I mean, you need the national security needs to be saying, you know, we're concerned that relationships about these kinds of machine learning programs being used in uh, ways that can do, um, you know, that can be fed into kind of uh, surveillance systems and, and these kinds of surveillance systems in partnerships with these kinds of military institutions are not good, right? That's a lot more specific than, and eh, we don't really like machine learning. You know, so I, I think being, you know, universities need to make sure that or be vocal about the fact that national security agencies are not being transparent enough and insisting that that mirror uh, remains a window uh, rather than, um, yeah, that one side. I like that. I like that metaphor. That was a great question. All right. Uh, continuing uh, more questions from the audience. Well, two questions. Uh, should we have a new Pearson-Laskin agreement between security organizations and universities? And perhaps you could, uh, for everyone's benefit, describe the Pearson-Laskin agreement first. So uh, this predates me, but I believe the Pearson-Laskin agreement was about government interference in the uh, university sector that like government would basically remain outside of these kinds of institutions. Um, really reluctant to tear up those kinds of norms. Again, this is me speaking from with my academic hat on, although my academic hat, I would think would normally be more pointy. But um, the fact that the no, I mean, what I'm talking about here is conversations, not direction, not um, I don't think we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't think we need a new agreement. We might need some tinkering. But again, I think the, the key thing is here is um, trying to keep as much of the current norms in place right now as possible, um, rather than kind of tearing everything up and, and starting anew. So I do appreciate that. Quite, and certainly I've heard a lot about that uh, particular agreement. I the, Not my total area of expertise, but I have heard that you know, as I've been speaking about this in the last like six weeks or so, I've heard that that explains a number of times. Do we need a new agreement? I'm always of the belief that no, the keep that wall in place, keep those kind of uh, separation um, in in place. But conversation should be there, and and national security should only in, be intervening if at all as an absolutely last resort. Ideally, that you know these proposals that are put out there, if there are concerns. Um, it shouldn't be national security saying no, and that's the end of it. They should be saying, well, we have a concern about this particular aspect of this program. Could you do this? Could you do, you know, could they actually provide guidance on how it could actually still be a feasible project rather than just, you know, the no hammer coming down? Um, on, I don't know if that's a stamp or a hammer, but either way, uh, that's, that's that. So no, keep, keep the norms in place as much as possible. And, um, but 
let's have conversations about how we can just make everything a little bit safer. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, and following up uh, on that, a guest asked, so what are your thoughts about universities being more proactive or bottom up, perhaps creating a culture where there's an expectation of transparency and articulation of risks and mitigations for international and commercially partnered research? Do you see that as an approach? I 100% see that as an approach. I think universities should be leading this, really. I mean, and that's just good practice anyways. Like, our research should be transparent, right? Our research, I mean, you want to protect certain results. And certainly, if you have data, you want to, you know, there's, there's things you need to protect about your research. Um, but absolutely, I mean, universities should be the ones leading this, right? Um, they should be, you know, universities themselves have their own values. They have their own culture. And they should be doing this in a sense, you know, I don't think they have to reinvent, again, the wheel, you know? they have these things in place. So what does transparency look like in accordance with the values of your university? Um, it, it, that, that to me is, is absolutely the way forward. And so, yeah, I would, I would agree with that very, very much. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, just time for one last question, Stephanie. What we've seen in the past kind of decade or 12 or so years is a move towards open science and open data. And now what you're talking about, some people would say is incompatible with the move towards open science and open data. Can you comment on that dichotomy? Yeah, and uh, this is something, you know, I, I had some meetings earlier this week where, you know, this is the, actually the issue with with scientists, right? Like they, they're, they're saying, you know, we don't need less open access, we want more open access, but they're not thinking about necessarily in terms of, of national security. So I think the issue is, it's like, who are your partners, um, what, when we're looking at um, the, you know, and, and, and this is, again, where the rub is, because a lot of science is about reproducibility, right? Do, can you take the same information, plug it into your equation and get the same results? Um, and, and this is where that becomes a problem. So sharing your results, not a problem. Uh, putting out your papers, not a problem. But if you're putting out your reams and reams and reams of open source data, like, are you, does it need to be out there or like, do you need to, you know, can you put it behind, um, you know, it's, it's like, I'll give you a good example. Um, for some reason you can't put court records online in Canada. Um, you know, this is something that I've come up with uh, or I've, I've, I've encountered. Uh, we were doing a book recently on the Toronto 18 case, which was a high profile violent extremism incident in Canada. And, um, we can't actually put you know, we wanted to have all the data for all the scholars to look at, but we had to actually put it behind a locked password, right? Uh, because uh, to protect the privacy of the individuals, even though these are public court records. Um, so it's kind of interesting. So it's like, are we, you know, does it have to be all or nothing? Or can you actually still control perhaps who has access to the data? Well, you know, if, if a researcher has a legitimate use for it, can you still provide them that data? So I think it's like, again, like, are, how are we thinking about who has access to what and what does open access actually mean? Does it just mean out there on the internet or does it still mean having some kind of layered control over who has access to what particular pieces of your information? And I think that's hopefully uh, the way of the future, but that's, that's a, such an interesting question. And I'm not sure we're going to solve that in the next minute, but I think uh, it's something that I think we need to keep talking about and scientists and universities need to explain that importance to government uh, going forward. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So again, what we've heard over and over in the last three days at the summit is communication, conversation, coordination, collaboration is key. Um, if we're collectively, to face this challenge and defeat it. So thank you very, very much, Stephanie. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. On behalf of uh, all of our summit guests and the Canary team, thank you so much. Thank you.